Courage and ignorance is a very potent combination for success. Uh, that person nodded and I said, in bracket, failure. The first thing which people commented was that, how can Major Captain Nekhi Singh, uh, Major A.K. Singh uh, go when he's got one, only one leg. <laughs> I had to make the finance minister myself bypassing the minister, uh, army headquarters, mi ministry of defense, ministry of finance and uh, that too nobody would allow me in even in uniform. And I had to catch him going down in a lift to <laughs> ask him for money. He said that uh, don't worry you'll come, uh, there'll be a time when you'll enjoy the storms. And I looked at him and I said this guy's crazy. Hello everyone, today on 40 Days, we are fortunate to have three members of the crew Trishna, which was the first Indian sailing expedition around the world. Six officers from the Corps of Engineers set sail in September 1985 from Mumbai. The team had a total of 10 sappers of whom six would be on the boat at any time. We have Brigadier TPS Chaudhary, who was the team manager, and Major A.K. Singh, a 100% disabled soldier. They had gone together to the UK to buy this yacht. Our third guest and crew member, Brigadier A.P. Singh, was already a national champion in yachting. We are also lucky to have with us Major P.S. Pammi, who previously led the Albatross expedition from Mumbai to Bandarabas in Iran. This discussion will be spread over two parts. Without further ado, let's hear from the crew of Trishna. Good evening, the Trishna team and our lovely sailor or notable sailor from USA. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have two members of the Trishna team in addition to myself, the third one, and uh, it appropriately fits in uh, of the anniversary, our uh, 36th Sixth. anniversary of the return of Trishna on 10th of January 1987. So, we do make it a point to meet at least once a year, either on 28th September uh, every year or on 10th of January and renew our contacts. And Touchwood has been a lovely innings to uh, meet and know the families and uh, their children also and probably in future, their children also. And uh, so it's a great pleasure to have our members, uh, uh, Major A.K. Singh and Brigadier A.P. Singh. Thank you, sir. And uh, also on the listening watch, uh, Major P.S. Pami. Uh, you all might have heard of the Trishna sailing expedition. It was the first sailing expedition around the world done by any Indians. And uh, it appropriately fits in, in the Limca Book of Records of which we have got it there. And uh, also, we've been uh, carrying out further expeditions on the Trishna. Uh, now, more about the boat itself, that uh, we wanted to do something which no Indian has done. And uh, so we decided what to do. So, sail around the world was a natural answer given uh, by all the sailors. and. Uh, Unfortunately, in India, there was no boat suitable to go around the world. So, we did a lot of research uh, by the crew members and especially Major A.K. Singh. And uh, he, in uh, turn, then we went to various institutions to select the boat. And we <coughs> said, okay, finally, we go to the United Kingdom to find a boat. And after a lot of research work and uh, uh, short sighting, uh, uh, short cutting the boats and all that, we came across uh, a 15 year old boat uh, in the Brighton Marina where we uh, decided to buy it. Unfortunately, the money given by the government was insufficient to buy a new boat which we wanted. So, we had to settle for uh, an 11 meter boat. But more about this, I will give it to Major A.K. Singh who was also uh, with me in the trip to UK to select the boat. Over to A.K. Uh, thank you, Brigadier uh, Chaudhary, sir. Uh, as uh, uh, I remember, I was about 27, 28 years old and uh, Major Pami's voyage in the Albatross had uh, introdu introduced me to blue water sailing and uh, it had uh, uh, quite an effect on, on, on us, 
Brigadier AP was there, me, KS Rao was also there on the Albatross. And I think all of us were smitten by the idea that what next, as uh, Brigadier Chaudhary brought out. Um, I think it was a dream or a thought, peripheral thought of almost all yachtsmen that, uh, well, let's uh, uh, sail around the world. Uh, but it was such a large and distant dream that very few of us would like to have voiced it because it sounded so absurd at that time, 1978 uh, or so. But yes, it was in most yachtsmen's mind and most yachtsmen from India uh, who had knew anything about sea sailing were from Corps of Engineers at that time. Uh, to write the project, to have it pushed through the uh, uh, engineer channels to the engineer in chief um, and then to the army headquarters. I mean, if you look historically, the project was entirely a Corps of Engineers project. The reason was that uh, it started originated from us yachtsmen from the Corps of Engineers. And uh, uh, also it wasn't uh, 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 something that we could tell the whole army or any other uh, arms and a joint Army, Navy, Air Force. It was, as I said, it was uh, too distant a dream for anybody to bite. But uh, I think we all were diligent. We worked very hard at the project. Brigadier Chaudhary, that then uh, Lieutenant Colonel, if I remember correctly, in the Corps of Engineers. That's right. And uh, he was instrumental in pushing it through the uh, uh, corridors of power. I think uh, innumerable ministries is the word. I don't think we can now correctly recount how many ministries, six, seven ministries. The bureaucracy was rather crushing. Uh, you write one reply, you get five questions back from them. It carried on. Most of us, we thought that, uh, you know, uh, this project might uh, not see the light of day. But I think our persistence paid off. And uh, what can I say? Uh, unfortunately, just before the government finally sanctioned the project. I crashed in a hang glider and lost my leg uh, above, above my knee. As uh, you can see here, uh, this is a pretty uh, <laughs> modern kind of a leg, uh, which you see here, uh, given to me by the army. And the big question was whether uh, I would sail around the world or no. But having been involved in the project for about uh, six years, five, six years till then, uh, you know, we, we Fogies are a, a dogged, determined lot. So once we take a bite, we don't give up very easily. <laughs> I think Pakistan also knows that. So uh, it was very clear to me that I wouldn't give up without uh, convincing myself that uh, whether I can sail around the world or no. Uh, well, the story is about us sailing in Trishna, so I'll stick to that line of uh, recounting. As Brigadier Chaudhary uh, mentioned, uh, we went uh, to UK to select a suitable boat. I had studied uh, a lot about boats by then. And uh, it isn't like I would like to uh, tell some of our viewers, it isn't like any boat that is, uh, you know, uh, floating on the water and has got a sail plan and a mast can sail around the world. No, it just isn't like that because uh, the oceans and their storms are, uh, what may I say, they are rather horrendous. When we try to recount some of them, even now, we get to goosebumps because uh, they, they really are, uh, and the boat has to be really tough, strong, starting from its design, its um, uh, architecture, its build, uh, built, its uh, toughness. Uh, uh, basically, in these matters, uh, there's a compromise between speed and safety. If you compromise on safety to get speed, you're going the wrong way. If you compromise on speed to get safety, you could be too slow a boat. There are other factors also uh, involved. So it is a very technical kind of a matter how to select a boat, um, which we learned, gleaned with a lot of help from British yachtsmen. Uh, the Corps of Engineers had sounded them, sounded them off to help us because many of them had sailed around the world. So I remember when I, when I went to UK, I must, uh, with the help of uh, Brigadier Neil Carlier over there and other yachtsmen in UK, we went over something like two, three hundred yachts, many of them only on uh, in their pedigree and on paper and things like that with the brokers and things, many of them which we went and saw. And finally, we settled for a 14-year-old third-hand boat, as uh, Brigadier Chaudhary brought out, 
which was uh, about 11 meters, which fell into a pretty small category of yachts that sailed around the world. But it was a tough boat uh, and uh, a good designed boat and uh, sparingly used by its earlier owners. It was a Swan class uh, designed by Sparkman and Stevens of UK, built in Finland, a, a very tough boat, uh, which finally, of course, saw us through all the way around the world. We shortlisted it. And uh, as Brigadier Chaudhary brought out already, money was very, very scarce. Uh, it would be laughable to say now that we finally settled uh, to buy that boat for about six and a half lakh of Indian rupees. But the six and a half lakh now was not the same as the six and a half lakhs then. It was quite a sum of money. But even then, you wouldn't get anything uh, new for that kind of money. So that's so much about the boat, sir. Thank you, AK. And, uh of course, while we were trying to get the government sanction, uh, you won't believe it that our own engineer chief had given up and said, Ki, I just can't progress, I do whatever you like. And one had to bypass a lot of army procedures, a lot of uh, uh, procedures which were questioned to me that how have you come to us? It should be the chief of army staff, or it should be the ENC, or it should be the vice chief. W what are you, Colonel Chaudhary? So you have been routed correctly. Yeah. Uh, you're not supposed to come directly to us. So, so. while, of course, all of this was going on, uh, what were you doing, AP? And waiting <laughs> uh, waiting for us to get the sanction, and uh, you uh, were on, on the list of also selection. You're and planning. Telephone. And planning. And planning, yeah. That time, uh, I was posted in the College of Military Engineering, Pune, and uh, it was actually side-by-side -side activity. A lot of uh, other data and material had to be collected for the voyage. So, anticipating that someday the sanction will come through, uh, you know, making the like uh, you have to make the route chart, the stoppages, the distance, time and distance, uh, how long it will take for each leg, which are the ports which you hold. Then uh, you go to the next step. Once you decide that, then uh, for navigation, you have a lot of um, marine charts which are used. And each, uh, mother, there will be literally hundreds of charts which will be used for a voyage like this around the world. So, you are, and there are actually thousands of charts uh, listed out which are there. So, you have to make a list of the charts which you have to carry because you can't miss out on even one chart because otherwise there will be a, uh, I mean, you, uh, uh, there will be a gap in your planning process while sailing. So, all that uh, requires a lot of uh, meticulous work to sit down and keep compiling those things. So. A lot of the time went in that and in the middle, as you will recollect, often I was called to Delhi to help push the file because <laughs> physically one had to actually be taking the file from one desk to the other, one ministry to the other, one uh, babu to the next uh, because nothing moves. You couldn't leave the file there, otherwise it will just vanish in the mountains of files. So, uh, in the middle, once in a while, I came and helped in that pushing. <laughs> Quite true. In fact, we had to get all the crew members turn by turn coming up and the prospective team members and to uh, do something because that incentive was there in the crew that we have to get this project through. Mm -hmm. Even though everybody told us, give up, give up. <laughs> but never given is my school <coughs> motto yeah. and also motto of other RIMC and others. <laughs> and uh, we decided we'll not give up. Yes. So, it was very nice. In the meantime, training was going on and uh, we did a lot of training. So, can you throw some light on the training we did, AK? Uh, actually, uh, we, uh, I was just telling somebody this evening, uh, uh, today, that uh, Courage and ignorance is a very potent combination for success. Mm -hmm. um, that person nodded and I said, in bracket, failure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what happens is, it's something like the albatross. I mean, if you had sunk to the bottom of the Arabian <laughs> Sea, you know, it would have taken, uh, a, 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 what would be responsible is courage and ignorance. So, the problem is that uh, 
only when we finally set sail and did some training under the trainer Ron Gravels, an old army officer, engineer officer who would, uh, you know, I'd like to call, uh, term him as an old sea dog, you know, in a, in a, in a friendly kind of a way, a pr professional to the core and a pretty hard man. He taught us how to sail uh, yachts or big boats um, into the oceans and into through storms, force seven, eight, ten, Beaufort scale and in highly tidal waters. It's only then that uh, the reality started dawning on us. I can think, I, I think I can speak for all of us, that what we are into. Till that time, uh, you know, it was uh, Arabian Sea or uh, parts of Bay of Bengal, which really don't represent uh, the Pacific Ocean, as they say, the mighty Pacific or the Atlantic Ocean or the Southern Oceans. But then it started dawning on us as to what we are into. But by that time, we had already bitten and there was no question of going back at all. So uh, I think uh, doggedness was uh, probably something that uh, paid off. And as I was probably just said some time ago, uh, that uh, uh, having worked on the project for five, six years, um, you know, uh, to a great extent, uh, like a kind of man, uh, like people possessed with this idea, having lost out on a lot of uh, promotion exams and things like that, as I can say for myself also, and uh, so-called, you could say, ruin my career, Sharia. That's a different thing. They're not comparable to sailing around the world in any case. The two are different dreams. Uh, just before the project came through, as I was saying, I don't know if we got that, but I lost my leg above the knee and in a hang gliding crash in Pune. And the big question came up from our seniors, from our generals, because, you know, I can look back now and try to visualize what they may have had in their minds. And they said, these guys, uh, I hope they're not going to let us down because they carry the Corps of Engineers flag, they carry the national flag. And uh, if uh, something were to happen to them, it would be a fiasco or, or, far, or probably far and, and, and uh, you know, um, uh, a matter that would take the name of the Corps of Engineers or the name of the nation down with them in the boat. No, I so remember said, that distinctly that yeah. uh, when we were making out the team and having a discussion, the first thing which people commented was that how can Major Captain A.K. Singh, Major A.K. <laughs> Singh uh, go when he's got one, only one leg? And uh, it was the sheer determination of A.K. which uh, I said if he's got a determination, let's put him in and have a look. Uh, I mean, why not give a chance? Uh, why reject him at this stage? So, well, we, I really pressed on. I said, let him do it. Uh, then, well, I uh, can say for myself that I was absolutely certain that unless I find a certain activity that I can't do, there was no question of letting up. Until the time I would activity by activity grade myself into being able to handle the boat in all its aspects, there was no question of giving up. And I found that uh, I could do it. I still remember that day in the, in the, uh, uh, in the, um, you know, near the Isle of Wight, uh, that uh, Ron brought the boat in, and we had to reef the main. Uh, the main, I think you may remember that. And he said, "Well, we need somebody to go up in this." And that was the first exposure to a uh, gale force winds. I got up to reef the sail, and it was it was no bravado. It was just a kind of a, a st study on myself. Could I do it, or could I not do it? And uh, I think such small building blocks brought me up, but it's about the whole team. It's not about me. All of us gelled together. We, we, we were a tremendous team and our, uh, uh, the plus point was that we were army guys. So some self-disciplining uh, was, uh, was already with us. Let us say, you know, two men on, two men off, getting up at a certain time, doing your chores, doing your duty and all came naturally to us. I think that was very instrumental uh, in our success all the way around the world. We bought the boat in England, we uh, uh, refurbished it, uh, 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 going into every kind of fitting with our own hands because in the middle of the Pacific you can't say, where's the plumber, I want my seacocks repaired or where's the electrician, I want my VHF antenna repaired, you can't do that. There's nobody who can fly, fly out there to try and fix it. So you have to be, uh, I always say, um, an ocean yachtsman uh, describing him is something like describing a gentleman. The description is endless. And uh, the main thing is that you are so self-dependent and so self-confident out there alone in the mightiest of oceans, 
uh, you are you are there there is an old adage that uh, goes uh, tough boats outla outlast tough men and the other one that we always says that if your boat lives you live so you clip yourself to your boat go through the storm and keep your boat alive so with that what you heard from ak uh, we then selected a team of uh, seven people initially mm -hmm. to come to uk uh, train there uh, at least six of us and uh, seven came later and uh, then set off from uk after some rigorous training uh, on 12th of october uh, 1984 yes and uh, with the complete uk sailors telling us that don't go now because october is not a good month the storms are moving uh, in from atlantic the storms are moving in and this rough weather what you have seen now and during training will not be the same however we had a time limit and if we didn't do it as it is the government was after us and uh, so we had to prove it to them to do it so we set upon a date of uh, 12th october and among, among much fanfare and being blessed by a pundit <laughs> who we got from london uh, he blessed us and we took off and the first encounter we had was in the bay of biscay where one had never seen a cyclone uh, you know getting in in, in the boat like albatross or rajhans <laughs> and all but we got caught in the cyclone in the famous or infamous bay of biscay, bay of biscay yeah. and uh, then uh, carried on further and but that was the worst part of the journey and uh, we then came to gibraltar and going through the mediterranean sea mm -hmm. was another bad weather aspect because we thought mediterranean is jolly good fun people go there to enjoy themselves but uh -huh. we had one of the worst weather in the and that's uh, in the summers you have a mediterranean summer with sun and sand and you know those people selling their umbrellas and beach beach life and uh, you know costly tourist tickets but not in the winters mediterranean yeah. in the winters with following oceans coming or following seas and, and storm coming all the way across the atlantic and funneling itself through the uh, straits of gibraltar and uh, uh, taking the the stormy winds right across the mediterranean Uh, with following winds we had to be very careful ap will tell us about a uh, ch chance of broaching and things like that which were the first experience on on a run with the storms you know so ap you were there and just tell us uh, that uh, uh, well i have must inform our audience or uh, viewers that uh, you have heard of stories of pirates uh, in our good old days that in uh, the 13th century or 14th or 15th or whatever and we never expected to encounter pirates uh, uh, in our journey so far so can you give us some accounts of uh, the encountering of pirates near lisbon and near the suez canal firstly as you are mentioning that uh, mediterranean is uh, not a sea to be sailed in the winter winters, actually yeah. no no westerner ever sails in the mediterranean in the winters True. because of the continuous storms and the weather conditions yeah i mean in terms of temperature and otherwise and uh, more so for us who are not used to freezing conditions being out in the sea and wet the whole time it's the worst possible combination one can get and still training ourselves at and we are still training we are not uh, you can say fully experienced Trained, yeah. mm -hmm. in handling a yacht in those conditions absolutely and when the seas are following following means uh, if you are heading in a particular direction the waves are coming from behind you waves on the wind yeah so you are actually not even seeing the waves because you are looking in front and every wave actually if you are not handling the boat properly the boat can just swing around they call it broaching and if it's if you don't control the boat in time it will just flip over because it'll come broad side to the wave and the wave will just roll you over roll it over yeah. so actually every wave 24 hours a day you have to manage every wave because you can't miss even one of them uh, because that's the end of the boat so that is and then it was not only the mediterranean uh, the, the red, red sea, sea red yeah. is another uh, a uh, sea which one never sails in that winters, uh, winters mm -hmm. because then the winds are directly from 
opposite direction and you can't go a straight course you have to go zigzagging so mm -hmm. actually you will be sailing about nearly more than twice the distance to cover a particular from a to b straight line along the sea mm -hmm. so that uh, was actually one of the toughest uh, legs of our uh, of our sail that time but if i remember correctly that's when you got news of the birth of uh, your daughter but you didn't know if it's a daughter or a son and if i remember correctly because red <laughs> sea being what it is we would jokingly in a storm say if he's a boy we'll call him lal singh <laughs> red sea uh -huh. <laughs> so, uh, it's only when we came to aden aden that uh, on the phone you got so, to know it's a, it's a girl yeah <laughs> yeah yeah we never had uh, long range radio <laughs> equipment because we we, we yeah. couldn't afford it that time so uh, our communicate we were never through directly back to india yeah. at any time point yeah. of time yeah. so it was And a tough tough my day. daughter was born during that leg mm. i came to know about her birth more than a month after it had happened <laughs> when we reached the next port and uh, that is how uh, we <laughs> sailed and how we were in Uh, connect with our families back home which actually there was no connect because even if you did have access to a, a telephone in a port in those days a, 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 none of the houses had uh, a telephone at home because phone was a ration quantity like waiting in queue for 6 7 years if you wanted a connection so there was absolutely no way one communicated you just wrote dropped a letter at a port and hoped that it would reach sometime that is the only yes, way that's right. and from a pco or a call office we only called delhi and delhi then uh, sent messages to all our families uh, that we have heard from them so we so. had our officers there who would communicate to the families mm. because family naturally were very worried not knowing where we were and uh, so that was a big problem in fact but nevertheless we definitely made it back on First uh, of February, first of February, mm. uh, yes. February uh, 1985, and uh, then set on, of course, to give the various reports and all that, and at the same time to set off to repair the yacht, which had got damaged very badly. En route, being a fiberglass yacht, our sails got torn, and we had to get new sails, which hardly any people in India used to make it. But nevertheless, we had received a lot of help from. Uh, the local yachtsmen and the uh, naval, dock naval dockyard, dockyard mm -hmm. uh, which i must thank again they really did help us mm -hmm. so we were ready to take it on and now we were at the mercy of the government to sanction us that the yacht has arrived now let's get on to the next phase and we were ready to sail out that very year only thing government again uh, didn't give us money and it was a uh, quite uh, if i tell you what had to be done was <laughs> that i had to meet the finance minister myself bypassing the minister uh, army headquarters ministry of defense ministry of finance and uh, that to nobody would allow me in even in uniform and i had to catch him going down in a lift to ask <laughs> him for money and he said oh my god you want the thing and you're doing all this nobody is helping you nice of mr pranab mugaji to oh. have helped and only that he said okay see me after lunch and that he sanctioned us some money and uh, where we could survive there so having done this of course we did more training and went to various parts and enlarged our team to 10 members and uh, we the thing was six members on the yacht at one time four permanent members and uh, one of us changing at uh, re reasonably completing one third of the journey around the world so everybody had a fair share of sales and we had to keep people informed to keep the families informed also communication part uh, to inform the government and everybody else and get us the money to be sent to the embassies so we can live there and otherwise uh, it was a big problem so finally after a lot of hurdles we started our journey around the world successfully on 28th of september 1985 mm. and uh, then uh, after sailing off from bombay on 28th september 85 uh, can you tell us the initial part settled south africa uh, the actually 
when we did physically sell out it was one of the most uh, really one felt the most relieved because for months <laughs> before that actually you were just running left and right paperwork getting the boat ready stocking it up there's a lot of work involved in uh, stocking the boat because you have to carry the food the water the as i said charts navigation charts books uh, marine books which you are, you have to carry pilots they are called which give describe various mm-hmm. oceans so there's there's un- endless work in uh, preparatory uh, in the preparatory phase before you actually sail off and when we actually cast off uh, it it was with a actually big sense of relief that we actually left and uh, of course uh, it was a very emotional moment too for uh, all of us because all the families uh, it was a big function at the sale of time and uh, all the families had come and that time most uh, of us had uh, few unmarried few had very small children small means 6 months 9 months and you will be leaving them for 2 3 years with no co- even communication with them you know in the future so anyway Once one way we, to get it <laughs> once we left now uh, it was still uh, we uh, the monsoons had not finished in india the west coast as you go down the monsoon uh, we caught up with the receding monsoons and the stretch uh, initial stretch was a very rough stretch because every day we still had a storm or two hitting us uh but uh, and by that time we were quite uh, reasonably able to handle the boat well so not too much of a problem used to the uh, storms eh? you are used to the storms <laughs> used to the storms <laughs> i i I'll, i'll say something here uh, ron gravels who was our, uh, who 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 uh, took us under his uh, tutelage and um, uh, initiated us into blue water sailing in uh, in the roughest uh, sail training areas of the world that's the english channel with its uh, race and the swing and the tremendous tides and the uh, uh, you know storms moving in uh, you know uh, like just like that i remember when he even in the biscay also and we sailed across and reached gibraltar you may recollect he used to say he said that uh, don't worry you'll come uh, there'll be a time when you will enjoy the storms and i looked at him and i said this guy's crazy but the truth is the truth is i can share it my personal feeling and i'm sure Uh, all of us uh, you know uh, you grade up to storms depending on their uh, uh, degree of difficulty you move up the scale if you've been through let's say a beaufort scale force 4 uh, then uh, when you next uh, hit a storm that's force 3 uh, you're quite comfortable in it and uh, when you move up to a storm force 8 we we on trishna uh, we have gone through force 10 bordering on force 11 which I think it's uh, it's uh, the worst that anybody can ever. 120-30 kilometers per hour, uh, 60-65 knots, uh, gust, 60 gusting to 65, and waves, uh, you know, uh, uh, 40-45 feet high waves. But what happens is, if I may say, that once the fury of the storm, or you've been through the eye of the storm, or the worst of the storm, as per your barometer readings and things like that, then the grandeur of the storm hits you. The sheer largeness of nature. it overpowers your senses if i uh, uh, i have used that word in my book also that you become one with the elements and that is the time i realized the truth of ron gravel's words that you really start enjoying a storm we were all silent like anything keeping our ears uh, cocked for any sound of any ship's engine and sh- quiet just listen to any ship's engine you would know what to do because you could make out which direction is coming from and in the middle of the night we were heading towards ascension and on a pitch black night this uh, speed boat approached us and just signal <coughs> and they came close and all they said was follow me so we looked at them i said ye pata nahi kahan le ja rahe hain kaun hai ye we touched uh, homeland mm-hmm. after 14 months oh. and uh, it was a lovely welcome there we had our chief of army staff we had the various uh, defense ministry people the governor of maharashtra and to welcome us
Friends, our Fauji's have been and continue to be the lifeline of our nation. Come hell or high water, they have always been there for us, whether in times of war or natural calamity or any other challenge India has ever faced. And the culture, traditions and history of the Indian military are part of a rich heritage, painstakingly preserved by one and all. To cherish and celebrate this heritage, a unique initiative called Fauji Days has been launched by the budding startup 99 Beagles. So what is Fauji Days? Well, it is primarily an oral history project based on interviews and recordings. Fauji's always have tons of stories to relate, many of them inspiring, thought-provoking, funny or engaging, and highly satisfying for the curious, especially young adults in their formative years. These engaging interactions between officers, men and women from our services with young adults from schools and universities are being captured on camera by us. We want to showcase the diversity of lived experiences on the one hand and the perceptions and expectations on the other. Allow me to also add that the scope of Fauji Day's initiative is not limited to just oral history. It also encompasses the written word and the world of military publishing Already, several books by eminent military authors have been published under this umbrella and all have been well received by the readers. The 40 Days website is another crucial resource designed to house the diverse aspects of this project. It features multiple blogs, reference and archival material and a community newsletter that highlights the progress made as well as the new recordings and books. Feel free to log on and subscribe. I warmly welcome you to be a part of this initiative, no matter what color uniform of Fauji wore or whether he or she served on terra firma, flew in the air or rode the waves. The fact remains that each one of these brave hearts is a reservoir of remarkable tales and cherished memories. Fauji Days wants to share these memories and tell these tales to a much wider audience. If a nation is made of memories, then Fauji Days will prove that Fauji men and women have contributed some of the best. As a Fauji, you can reach out to us and tell us about your rich experiences. Get in touch and we will revert with an audiovisual team equipped to capture your recall. Or if you're too distant, we can guide you about how to record and send it to us. Of course, you can also write your tale and send it to us to be featured here. We have the wherewithal to capture you on video from whatever location on the planet. All we want is to know your story so that India knows her story better. It is incomplete without yours. Please also feel free to send your contributions to this archive of India's valor in the form of nostalgic pieces, anecdotes, pictures or other content you may wish to share with the wider 4G Day community. On behalf of Team 99 Beagles, I thank you. As they say, Fauji days never end. In fact, they are just beginning. So, Fauji days forever. Jai Hind.